10 minutes ago. Ukrainian army hit the Russian ship Sevalod Bobrov. According to the breaking news, the Ukrainian army hit the Russian ship Sevalod Bobrov. The attack launched by the Russian Federation against its western neighbor Ukraine continues unabated. Since the first day of the attack, the Ukrainian army, which has been trying to drive out the enemy who attacked its country, realized that this was not the solution and started an offensive against the Russian army. The Ukrainian army, which destroyed many military vehicles of the Russian army in the air and on the ground, also coveted the sea vehicles of the Russian army. According to a breaking news today, the Ukrainian army neutralized the Russian ship Sevalod Bobrov. The Ukrainian army, who wants to take back the Snake Island, is constantly watching the Snake Island with Baractor TV too. Every time a landing craft gets there, it destroys it. The Ukrainian army launched an attack on the detection of the Russian landing craft Sevalod Bobrov around Snake Island the other day. The Russian ship Sevalod Bobrov was Ukraine has been taking areas back from the Russians. How is Putin absorbing the reality that he so seriously miscalculated? Russia repelled this aggression. This was the only correct decision. Moscow is not going to stop at Ukraine. These are Ukrainian defenses on the northern edge of that front. Russia is focused on capturing that strategic region in eastern Ukraine, but that push appears to be stalling. Even if they are successful, we are not confident that the fight in the Donbass will effectively end the war. And this has been one of the things that Ukraine has consistently said, is that Moscow is not going to stop at Ukraine. He went over his justification for the operation in Ukraine, saying again that it was self-defense. They openly were preparing for yet another punitive operation in Donbass, for an invasion of our historic lands, including Crimea. In Kiev, they were talking about the possible acquisition of nuclear weapons. The contrast used that President Volodymyr Zelensky released a video. He was very determined to say that the eastern regions which are occupied currently by Russian forces are going to be liberated. Slowly but surely, Ukraine has been taking areas outside to the north and east of Kharkiv back from the Russians. Ukrainian officials say in the wake of that retreat, they are recovering the bodies of Russian troops. They accuse Russian officials of making no effort to bring their Russian dead home. Каждым днем все дальше и дальше, да, были такие сомнения, что нас не выведут, и мы там останемся навсегда. It is the last remaining stronghold, the holdout for Ukrainians. Uh, the rest of Mariupol, which is on the Azov Sea, has essentially been taken over by the Russians. The preliminary investigation, at least according to Ukraine, shows that a 21-year-old man by the name of Vadim Shishimaram reportedly shot and killed a 62-year-old man.
Well, my response would be that you caused this. Look at the mirror. Top officials in Finland are wanting to see their NATO application process just as quickly as possible. And Russia's foreign minister is warning of retaliation. The bill is passed without objection. And it brings the total of U.S. help for Ukraine now to $53 billion. As part of this unannounced visit, they went to the suburb of Irpin. We know that's a site of horrific violence where you have investigators looking at civilians who have been killed there, investigating them as war crimes. It is clear that Vladimir Putin is responsible for heinous war crimes. There must be accountability. I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you all to Canada and to our beautiful province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Military thinking and particularly the Russian ground forces, they have always made um, very good use of artillery. And we look back to Chechnya, Georgia, Syria, all of these um, operations have been characterized by uh, heavy reliance uh, Russian forces on artillery. Uh, artillery has caused by far the largest number of casualties uh, and if you look at the number of Russian fatalities thought to be around 15,000 you would realistically estimate that a two or three times that number have received life-changing injuries. By far uh, the majority of those casualties have been caused by uh, artillery and if you look at the destruction of cities like Mariupol that is the wholesale destruction of the built environment by artillery. So it is the, the dominant weapon of this war and indeed any war that follows this kind of pattern. Artillery can produce rippling barrages that plaster the landscape here in eastern Ukraine in much the same fashion it did during World War II without much accuracy. What's new in Ukraine is a widespread use of laser guided shells to pick off individual targets. Here, Ukrainian artillery knocks out four tanks, one after the other. Unlike the infantry soldier with his javelin missile launcher, the guns knocking out these vehicles might be 20 kilometers away. This strike was by Russian artillery, a 152 millimeter shell knocking out a Ukrainian tank. Well, there's a few developments in artillery, as you know, since the Second World War. Obviously, the kinds of shells uh, that are used, uh, but perhaps the most profound development has been the networking of artillery systems into a modern and quite complex battlefield command system that not just allows the management of fire missions and the prioritisation of them, but allows the tracking of artillery shells so the logistics of artillery can keep up with the pace of modern war. Those images hint at another significant development, the importance of drones, both in finding targets for artillery and in many other ways. When hunting Al-Qaeda in Iraq, American intelligence officers coined a term for the persistent surveillance of people and places. They called it the unblinking eye. In Ukraine, the unblinking eye exposes anything moving to attack or being countered by manoeuvre. Both sides are using drones in large numbers. It means it's becoming harder and harder to find a hiding place on the battlefield. What we're seeing now in this transparent battle space is a constant flow of data, whether it's from space or from social media, which gives you clues and cues as to where to look, whether you're looking for a formation or a, an individual. Some of those lessons are, have been learned in Iraq and Afghanistan are now being applied at scale. The logo here is that of Aero Razvidka, a volunteer collective of Ukrainian tech nerds who've built their own drones and armed them, dropping munitions onto Russian targets. Finding a target and then hitting it is an example of fusion. Linking drones, electronic intercepts, all kinds of intelligence to strike weapons, as we see the Ukrainians doing here, shows that they've been more successful than the Russians in adopting fusion, as practiced in the American War on Terror 
to hit all kinds of targets, but including generals. The Ukrainians have done what appears to be a really good job of taking the intelligence feeds that they've got, fusing them, um, and then really thinking about how they target tactically, but also at the operational level, um, taking out the Moskva, taking out a series of high-level Russian field commanders are victories of intelligence. Intelligence and the clever use of it, I think the Ukrainians have done very well at, um, the Russians not so. Air superiority has been defined as central to military success for decades, but the Russians haven't achieved it, leaving onlookers wondering whether that's their incompetence or something deeper is changing. Ukraine has used Soviet-era air defense missiles and combined them with thousands of shoulder-launched ones sent in by NATO countries. The result is that the Russians have lost dozens of aircraft and been unable to gain air superiority. The Western air forces used to operating in uncontested skies over Iraq or Afghanistan, it's a reminder that effective air defense can swing a campaign and threatens the future of the pilot. There's no doubt in my mind that there's a, a trend towards unmanned and autonomous systems. Um, there has to be as defences get more lethal. Um, as you seek to achieve decisive mass without committing millions of, of people, uh, then, then the use of unmanned, uh, the use of aut more autonomous systems, I think is inevitable. But the fact that Russia is relying on cruise missiles to do things at range is to a large extent driven by the fact that his air force has been pretty well neutered uh, by the Ukrainian both ground and air forces. So what the Russians have done is rely on missiles like the Iskander to hit targets deep in Ukraine rather than risk pilots and highly expensive fighter jets they've used the unmanned solution. Air and sea launch cruise missiles have been employed as well in order to hit targets in Western Ukraine in places like Lviv. Indeed, the Russians now rarely use crewed aircraft beyond their own front lines and stay very low when they do so. I think it's clever to use long range missiles for you know, strategic and operational strike missions if you don't have, a, have to put a valuable uh, fighter with its crew at risk when you can use a missile, uh, I think that is the clever employment of air power. Indeed, I think that is where most Western air forces need to go. They need to have more unmanned systems and more unmanned strike missiles, whether they're air or ground launched. It's not just piloted aircraft that are under threat from a combination of an unblinking eye of surveillance and a variety of missiles and other defences. In Ukraine, once again, we're hearing questions about whether we're witnessing the death of the tank. We've seen so many armoured columns turned into scrap metal that many have concluded that advancing with people inside these vehicles is becoming suicidally difficult. By providing thousands of lightweight anti-tank weapons like the Enlor, Western countries have compounded Russian difficulties but people walking across the battlefield are very vulnerable. These Ukrainians are setting up a shot with a javelin missile. Watch the man on the right. He's constantly looking around for drones or other signs of the enemy. Without the protection of an armoured vehicle, they need bravery and luck. The reality of the war in Ukraine is that it's dominated by, by shot and shell, whether it's fired from the air or, or from the ground and the only way you can move in that environment is through the protection of an armoured vehicle and the only way you can move across difficult country is to have either a tracked armoured vehicle or a very big wheeled armoured vehicle so armoured vehicles have not gone out of fashion in any way what is changing is the way that the protection is done because there are new materials and new ways of providing protection to an armoured vehicle which shouldn't <laughs>